have no sense of knowing that God has closed that door, you are going to be ramming into it. I thank God that the story of the cross is not just for sinners, the story of the cross is for saints. Isaiah chapter 6 Verse 4 The sound of their voices shook the door frames And the temple was filled with smoke I said Who is me for I am undone Because I am a man of unclean lips And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away. In today's message, we are talking about the power of obedience. The ability to destroy religious bondage. The ability to destroy religious bondage. And the recurrent thought in today's message is disobedience attracts a religious bondage that replaces a rightful devotion and the relationship with Christ. Disobedience breaks or brings a religious bondage that replaces a personal relationship with God. When you are caught in a lifestyle of disobedience, you attract in your life a religious bondage. You attract in your life religious spirits that makes you to remove your devotion on Christ. And you put your devotion on works. And that's what we want to deal with today. Obedience breaks that bondage. Obedience breaks the bondage. That which I have termed in here a religious bondage. Obedience to the word of God. Obedience to the authority of God. Breaks that bondage. What is religion? Religion is an attempt, is a way of reaching out to the supreme God, to the supreme being. That's what religion is. Religion is an attempt, is an effort where we want to please God with our works. That is what religion is. Religion is an attempt to try to reach out to God using our own ways, not the prescribed way of God. Religion demands that we do it our way. But a walk, a genuine walk with God demands that one has a personal relationship with God. If truly you want to have faith in Christ, it means you first and foremost have to have an encounter with him. You must have an encounter where there is an exchange in your life. An exchange of your allegiance. Where you say God should be first and you should be the second. You have to have an exchange of allegiance where God takes takes preeminence in your life where there's an exchange of your dead life and the living life of christ comes inside of you the bible says in romans that he sends in within us a law of the spirit and life when we have an encounter with christ god sends within us because without Christ, we are dead in our trespasses. Anyone who does not have Christ, he is dead 
if they are trespassers spiritually, their spirits are not awakened to God. They are not awakened to the power of God. They are not awakened to the sensitivity of God. They are dead in their trespasses. But when you have an encounter with Christ, your spirit is awakened. Your spirit, the Bible says in the old King James Version, it is quickened. Your spirit is made alive. And it's made alive spiritually, miraculously, powerfully by the spirit of God. Because God says, he sends the law of the spirit and life. And he ignites life inside of you. There is life inside of you. And that experience is called to be born again. That experience is on God's terms. That experience is on God's conditions. It is only you come with faith that God is going to do it. It is a miracle of God. It is mysterious, but it's a miracle of God. All you present to him is faith to receive. Faith to receive what he has enacted in your life. Now religion is different. Religion says, I am going to do all I can to make God be pleased with me. I'm going to do everything I can so that God falls in love with me. But the Bible says in uh, 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 Isaiah 64 that everything that we bring before God, every work that we bring before God, it is as filth rags. Every work that we bring before God, every righteousness that you bring before God is as filth rags. Rags that are filthy. They are not just uh, rags, but they are filthy rags. That's how he describes them. So no good work can make an, an access to the kingdom for you. A good work will not make you enter the kingdom of God. So you need to understand that you have to have Christ inside of you. But religion does not say so. But when you read in the scriptures, you will come to realize that there are many times when evil spirits inspire loyalty to religious concepts and practices in such a way as to oppose and possibly to counterfeit the work of God. Evil spirits, they can come in somebody's life. They can change your perception such that you remove your loyalty on God and you put loyalty on practices. You put loyalty on rituals. You put loyalty on ceremonies. You put loyalty on the things of works. To the point, because the devil knows that you and me are incurably religious. We love religion. It doesn't matter what type of religion you subscribe to. Whether it is Hinduism, whether it is atheism. Atheists will say that's not a religion. But Pasaniki will demonstrate that it's a religion in itself. But whatever religion you subscribe to, in the heart, there is an emptiness. It cannot be filled by nothing but by God. So people desire to fill that emptiness with something. So some people may go to different forms of religions. Some people may even go to materialism, to affluence. They want to, to fill the hole inside their hearts with something. And people love to fill that hole in their hearts with religion. But the devil knows that you and I and everyone listening by radio and watching by television, that we love to pursue after the supreme being, whichever supreme being is. We love because somehow we were created to worship God. And in our blindness sometimes, we pursue different gods. And the devil knows that. So he presents to people a loyalty to practices, a loyalty to traditions, a loyalty to rituals, 
rituals that makes them to be bound and to oppose God. And sometimes they want to replace God in that, uh, in that place. So I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that a religious bondage is a plan of the devil. A religious bondage is a plan of the devil. He seeks to pervert the religious instinct, the religious desire that is within mankind by deception. The devil himself, he seeks to deceive you. He seeks to deceive me. He seeks to deceive those listening by radio, watching by television. He seeks to deceive them so that they do not focus on God, but they focus on practices, rituals, ceremonies that will replace God. It's a religious bondage. A religious bondage, which I truly believe can, can be, uh, be a creation of a demonic spirit, is a mindset, is a lifestyle that wages war against the grace of God. A religious bondage is a lifestyle, is an attitude, and I have said many times, orchestrated by demonic spirits. But the whole desire of a religious bondage is to make the grace of God of no effect, of no power. Is to replace the grace of God with man-made religion, with man-made systems. That's what religion or religious bondage is all about. And that's what we want to deal with today. Now, this religious bondage makes you never to have a fulfilling relationship with God. If you are caught in this religious bondage, you do not understand how wonderful and how enjoyable it is to have a relationship with God. You are caught up in the practices and the rituals to fulfill that which you think God demands of you. It's a religious spirit. It's a religious bondage. God wants you to be free and to be free indeed. Those listening by raid and watching by television, God wants you to be free and free indeed. No strings attached. He doesn't want you to come with your works. Your works cannot save you. He doesn't want you to come with your riches. Your riches cannot save you. He wants you to come as you are and he will free you and free you indeed. In the text we have read, Isaiah chapter number 6, verse 9 and verse 10, there is a cryptic message that God gives Isaiah. Isaiah is in the praises of the Lord. And he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne high and lifted up. I saw the Lord. And he says, as the glory of God filled the temple like smoke and the foundations of the temple shook. The tail or the train of his robe filled the whole temple. And I saw the seraphims flying above and they were saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And he says, when I was in his praises, I said, I am undone. I will die. For I have seen the Lord. And God sends the seraphims who go to the altar. And he gets a call out of the altar. And he flies to me. And he rubs that hot call over my lips. And he declares. And he says, now you are made clean. While I'm in the praises of the Lord. While I'm experiencing this cleansing of my sins. I hear the Lord speak. And he says, who shall go before us? Whom shall we send? And I knew God was so wise. He was speaking to me even if he did not direct the question to me. And I said, here I am, Lord. Send me. And this is now the message he gives him. He says, you, this is the message I'm telling you. You go tell them. This is the message you are going to tell Judah. You hear 
you continue here but you don't understand you see you continue to see but you do not perceive he says there is something wrong about my people they have got eyes they can see vision but they do not perceive they have got ears they can listen when you talk to them but they do not understand he's saying there is a depth of understanding they do not have they are superficial now you go tell them that i'm not going i'm no longer going to be giving them a message because they have been hearing but they don't understand they have been seeing but they do not perceive they have no discernment at all they are bound in their practices now i the lord have said i'm going to give them up go tell them that i'm no longer going to speak to them lest they understand lest they perceive lest they convert very cryptic message he says that's the message i've given the reason is they have not obeyed my word therefore they are caught in a religious bondage they are caught in the practices the words has come they have seen the word they have they have their eyes but they do not perceive they have their ears but they do not understand their heart they have the word has been spoken to them but they have never discerned he says you go tell them you go tell them that this is the judgment of the lord that's the message that god gives to isaiah now when you read in mark chapter uh, matthew chapter 13 verse 10 to verse 17 jesus refers to the same text you also see him referring to the same text in mark chapter 4. jesus gave the parable of the sower you remember the parable of the sower he gives the parable of the sower but he does not interpret he is with a big crowd he gives the parable of the sower and he does not interpret then he goes to a private place with his disciples and the disciples are scratching their heads and he says ah, what is it about you when you are in the crowd you speak the parable you don't interpret but when you come to us you interpret the parable that's this is confusing we thought the people that needed to hear the parable and to have the interpretation are the thousands that were hearing and jesus refers to this verse in verse 9 and verse 10 he says these people they keep on hearing but they don't understand these people they keep on seeing but they do not perceive these people they keep on hearing it are getting the word into their message but it has never dawned on them they have no discernment so there is no need for me to interpret for them but these secrets of the kingdom are for you that's why i come and interpret for you here is a principle when you obey the word of the lord there will be more revelation that will come to you when you obey the word of the lord more revelation will come to you when you disobey you will not get any more revelation simple when you obey the word of the lord that comes to you god will give you more revelation on that word but if you do not obey the word of the lord you will not access more revelation from the lord so jesus christ says there is no need for me to interpret for the multitudes because they do not want to understand they do not want to listen they were originally given but they do not want to understand <clears throat> so that's the message that isaiah is given and jesus actually quotes it in two times now what is jesus christ saying he's saying my people are caught up into religious activities that do not give them life if they are going to have life they have to pursue it if they are going to have a revelation they have to forge through and get it but i'm not going to just give it to them they must understand they must receive the message so out of this text in isaiah chapter number six the message that isaiah receives he speaks to the children of judah many countless times you will find it throughout the book of isaiah how he comes up and he bashes the spirit 
of religious bondage. In chapter number one, he begins with the same message. He says, you come to me with your tithes. You come to me with your offerings, but your hearts are far away. I, the Lord, have decided I'm not going to look at your offering. I'm going to look the other way. You come with everything you think this is holy, but your hearts are not cleansed. Your hearts are not changed. You have no inward transformation. I, the Lord, has determined I'm not going to look at your offerings. I'm going to turn. So you will see that Isaiah, from time to time, he comes back with this message. Turn away from a religious bondage. Your hands are full of what is looking nice. But inside, there is pollution of your hearts. Inside, there is corruption. Inside, there is evil. Yes, in your hands, you've come with tithes. In your hands, we've, you've come with a wave offering. But inside your heart, there is deceit. Inside of your heart, you are far away from me. Therefore, I will not accept. That is a religious bondage. Now, from time to time, prophets would speak against that religious bondage. Because from time to time, the whole nation will be swept under this bondage. And prophets would rise up and would speak against this religious bondage. Of how they would come with, with you know, showy faces to the Lord, but their hearts are far away from him. And prophets would come and would speak and would demand obedience, would demand a turnaround, would demand for them to repent of their sins. This is a religious bondage that you see in these scriptures. And Isaiah is going to start attacking it. From chapter number one, he comes against it. In chapter number five, he comes against it. Chapter number six, he comes against it. Chapter number 26, he comes against it. There is a spiritual, religious bondage, a loving of works to replace the life of God. So quickly, I have a few thoughts that I have put here and I want you to look at them. Number one, a religious bondage influences people to try to earn God's love and salvation through practices of rituals and ceremonies. When we talk about Malawi being 80% Christians, a lot of them are in a religious bondage. A lot of them. It's not genuine heart to heart relationship with God. It's people that want to do works. They want to end God's love through practices of rituals and ceremonies. They think if they are baptized in water, they will go to heaven. They think if they have done nice at the church, God would look at them. And they are caught into this theology of scales. That's not Christianity. That, you know, God will put your works on scales. Balances. Balances this side, your good works this side, your bad works this side. And if your good works outweigh the bad works, then God says, enter the kingdom of heaven. So people want to do good works. They want to do everything they want to do so that it outweighs the scale. That is not scriptural. That's from another religion, not Christianity. Good works will not open the door to the love of God and to salvation. That is a religious bondage. That is a religious bondage. So you cannot win Christ. You cannot win his love. You cannot access his salvation through practices of rituals. Number two, this religious bondage makes people to judge others by their appearances. And it demands that they fit a certain legalistic criteria. This religious spirit, the religious bondage, it makes others 
It makes people who are bound in this bondage to judge others. If they are not dressed the way they think Christians are supposed to be dressed, they tell them they are not Christians. In some places, some particular food, if you don't eat particular food, or if you eat particular food, they'll tell you you are not a Christian. If you eat pork, they'll tell you you are not a Christian. And they will demand, they will become police officers to legislate Christianity moral laws. We do not have that in Christ. That is a religious bondage. Christianity is not about appearance. It is about a heart relationship with God. It's not about how you dress. Of course, you must dress modestly. It has nothing to do with you coming in a bikini at church. And you flash all the time, such that I'm even failing to pray for you. That has nothing to do with your salvation. That has to do with you tempting me. That's the only difference. But it has nothing for you to go to heaven. It is important for us to understand. Religious bondage demands people to appear in a particular way. But you need to be broke, to, to break through, to break free from that religious bondage. Number three, it makes people to be passionate and to desire and to have effort to conform to outward holiness. Outward holiness without inward transformation. So a religious bondage, a religious spirit demands on works, demands on, oh, we go to church on such and such a day, a holy day. We go to church on such and such festival day, holy moon. The Bible says, all these holy days, holy moons, holy festivals were a symbol, were a shadow of Jesus Christ. The real person is Jesus Christ. If you have Jesus Christ, you have everything. The Bible says, do not allow anyone to judge you over Sabbath days, over uh, holy days, holy moons, because all these were a shadow. It is a religious bondage when you insist to conform to an outward holiness without an inward transformation. God demands an inward transformation. God demands that you become born again. God demands that you repent of your sins. You turn away from your sins and you follow him. That's what he demands first. It's an inward transformation. First and foremost. But a religious bondage demands outward holiness. Number three, number four, a religious bondage makes you to, f to fear of not being good enough. Fear of not being good enough. Why? Because it is all set on works. It is all set on your good works. How will you know that your good works are good enough? How will you know that you are perfect in your works? So every time there is guilt in your life, there is guilt in people that follow these religious spirits because they want to fulfill works in following God. It is not the salvation that God gives. Number five. Religious bondage makes people to fear other people. A fear of people is a major characteristic of a religious bondage. Fear of people. Fear of what people are going to say. Fear of systems. Fear of, you know, uh, ceremonies. There is a story in first samuel chapter number 15 you need to go read it it's an interesting story it's a story of king saul who is gone who is taught to go and destroy amalek or the amalekites 
these Amalekites were a tribe that barricaded or that um, did not allow the children of Israel to enter or to through their territory as they were going to the promised land. And God had promised, he said, I am going to destroy the Amalekites because they refused my people to pass through their territory as they were going to the promised land. So God tells the first king, King Saul, and he tells him, now that you are king, go destroy the Amalekites. So King Saul takes the army and he goes and surely he destroys everyone. But God had given him uh, a message. He says, this will be like, you know, a burnt offering. You have to destroy everything. Destroy totally everything. Just like God had taught Joshua to go destroy everything in Jericho. In Joshua's time, somebody stole, I can store from, uh, uh, from uh, the inhabitants of Jericho. And he did not want to destroy everything. Similarly, in this time, we have uh, King Saul who does something. What does he do? He keeps some choice uh, cattle. Very nice breed of cattle. And he says, we are going to give offering to the Lord using this cattle. And then he also keeps the king of that land. The king's name is Agag. He decided to keep him and bring him as a slave, as a trophy of what had happened in the battlefield. He brings him to Jerusalem. So as they were arriving, uh, the prophet went to see him. And uh, Saul came and he was so happy. He spoke out and he says, Wow, oh, the Lord be praised. The Lord be praised. Shalom. 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 The Lord be praised. Oh, we've done what the Lord wanted us to do. And Samuel says, Uh-uh. What of the animals I'm hearing bleating? And he says, No, 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 no. We kept these for a sacrifice. And by the way, I kept Agag. I brought him as a trophy. And Samuel says, but the Lord said you should destroy all. You should destroy all. How come you had selective obedience and you decided to destroy some and keep some selective obedience? But the Lord said, destroy all. And in verse 21, he throws in a statement that is very strange. He says, it was the people that persuaded me to keep these animals. It was the people. The Bible says, the fear of the law, the fear of men brings bondage. The fear of men. When you trust in men, you are trapped in a bondage. So, religious bondage is bound on this desire to satisfy other people. This desire to be nice to other people. This desire is a very strong desire to be accepted in the crowd. To be accepted as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the clear message of the Lord, God wants you to obey him. No matter what, he wants you to obey him. Not selective obedience. He wants you to obey him totally. Because the fear of men who trapped you. The fear of men who destroy you. The fear of people who destroy you. Because now, you are not going to aim to satisfy him who called you. You'll be satisfying people. You'll be satisfying systems. He says of satisfying God. The fear of men will trap you, will destroy you. So it's important for us to understand that the religious bondage brings the fear of people. Number six, religious bondage causes people to have a performance-based religion instead of a grace-based relationship. Performance 
based religion instead of grace based relationship God has called us to a life of grace yes when we have received grace then he wants us to totally offer ourselves to him when we totally offer ourselves to him we are going to do works not because we want to be served but because we love him because we are already served because we are already delivered because we are already brought into the kingdom of god we are doing it in love we are not doing it to end salvation we are not doing it to end our righteousness we are doing it to end rather to do to please him who has called us number seven religious bondage breeds an atmosphere for false prophets and prophecies an atmosphere for false prophets and prophecies false prophecies bind people to holy men false prophecies bind people to rituals false prophecies where there is no understanding of the grace of god there is always a vacuum and that vacuum is replaced by false prophecy is replaced by legalism is replaced by works where there is no clear understanding what the grace of god does there is always a vacuum and that vacuum is replaced by false prophets false prophecies who will speak the word and the word will bind people to them the word will bind people to their rituals the word will bind people to their ceremonies the, their word of the prophets will bind people to the activities of the prophets you see it in the scriptures you will find where people instead of following god they'll start following false prophets and these pro false prophets they have a whole system of religion the whole system of works the whole systems of rituals the whole system of ceremonies they will have everything that will look like they are following god but it's a deception it's a deception it's a religious bondage the unfortunate thing is that we have in the church a lot of people that are bible illiterate i'll repeat we have a lot of people that are bible illiterate they carry their bibles but they're in their hands they're in their mobile phones they're in their mobile devices but their bibles and their word is not in their heart it's not in their minds so they do not understand that this prophecy is not godly prophecy it is a spiritual bondage it is a religious bondage i'm being bound into a religion of works a religion that pleases men <clears throat> a religion that moves me all from god and looks at men it is works and works and works and works it moves you from placing more emphasis on on the word of god and you place emphasis on traditions number eight an emphasis on traditions traditions of the past traditions of the past a religious bondage makes you be trapped in traditions always asking we've never done it this way before our fathers did it this way did it this way did it this way it's a religious bondage traditions when they have no power of god they are not good traditions i have put in the scriptures you know a scripture from uh, second timothy second timothy chapter number uh, three if we can read second timothy chapter number three verse number one <coughs> it says second timothy chapter number three verse number one but understand this that in the last days there will come times of difficulty this is english standard version for people will be lovers of self lovers of money proud arrogant abusive disobedient to their parents ungrateful 
unholy, heartless, and unpeaceable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Number five, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. They will maintain the outward appearance of religion but will have repudiated its power. And Paul, in those days, tells Timothy, run away from them. Turn away from them. Now, if you look in the text, just as in the text in Isaiah, he has been saying to Judah, the people of God. Just like in here, Paul, when he describes, he describes religious people. Now, if you read that text, I can literally show you that that message you can relate to the message in the church today you can find in the people the, that come to church lovers of money instead of lovers of god you can find the same description that paul says two thousand years ago he says in the last days there will be perilous times there'll be difficult times People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient. He says they have the form of godliness. They have religion. They have everything that shows they are men and women of God. They have everything that looks like they are people that worship. But they deny the power of God. They are bound in a religious spirit religious bondage my prayer today is that no one at ICA should be bound to a religious bondage in Jesus' name that you should be a person that has had an encounter with Christ and he lives on the basis of the grace of God nothing else but the grace of God that you will to God because of the works that you do you will not seek salvation because of the works that you have your righteousness that you have but you will seek God and seek him based on his terms that he says come through Jesus Christ Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world so there are people that have the form of godliness but they deny the power thereof so when we talk about malawi being 80 percent christian it is a lot of form of godliness but there's no power at this time we started realizing there must be a revival in that 80 percent and we are part of that 80 percent we are part of that 80 percent that when we are revived genuinely revived genuinely seeking the face of god genuinely walking in power genuinely walking in the relationship with jesus christ this country will be changed my family will be changed my clan will be changed my society will be changed my community will be changed my organization will be changed because there will be a glory of god emanating from me there is power when we follow god when we get connected with god may god break the religious bondage over this country in jesus name i said may god break the religious bondage over this country in jesus name and quickly number nine he said you will see that the religious bondage doesn't accord others mercy lack of concern for the needs of people mess is never demonstrated that's why that's why the prophets it's interesting the the more you read the prophet that's why you see that the prophets talk about justice again and again because there is a tendency people that are self-righteous never to give mercy and grace to others i'll repeat there's a tendency 
people that uh, work there, like they say, you know, they 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 want themselves from the uh, from the traps of the boob traps. They want to work on their own. They want to force that they are the only ones that do it, that they have their own righteousness. They want to show that they have done it by themselves. Therefore, they don't give grace to others. They are not merciful to others. Justice is never rendered to others. So you will see that Isaiah brings the issue of justice centerpiece to his message. Every time the prophet rises up to speak, they speak about justice. They speak about justice in the home. They speak about justice to the woman. They speak about justice to, you know, to the child. They speak about justice to the slaves. They speak about justice to the people you know, that are not paid properly. You see it again and again. We cannot be Christians who are so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly good. We want just to go to heaven quickly. If God wanted you to go to heaven immediately you became born again, you would have been dead already. But he kept you here because he wants you to be the salt of this earth, the light of the world. It's a deliberate issue that God wants us to see. And lastly, I've already referred to this, there is no power. A religious bondage influences you to crave for religious power. Yet reject, rejecting the power of the Holy Spirit. There is power in religion. Amen. <laughs> there is power in religion. I take, take you to a lot of false prophets that masquerade themselves as pastors and uh, holy men of God. There is power the way they control people. There is power in religion. There is power in religion. Because there is an ability to control in religion. You have to remember the devil is behind it. He controls. He wants to replace your allegiance to God. So he can place himself there. So there is power in religion. But God doesn't want us to be religious. He wants us to have a, a life with Christ. He wants us to have a relationship with Christ. That's what he wants to do. And how do we break that religious bondage? Simple. Number one, turn away. Turn away from the bondage of religion. Paul says, turn away from that spirit. The ability, the desire to have the form of godliness, but rejecting the power of God. Turn away from it. Number two, obey the word of God and its authority because that breaks the bondage, the hold of the religious attitude over your life. That's number two. Obey the word of God. Number one, turn away from the form of godliness. Number two, obey the word of God. Number three, trust and rest in the grace of God. Trust and rest in the grace of God. Friends, Grace is everything. You can't add to grace. You can't add to grace. Grace is everything. He died for us. He saved us by his grace. Nothing else. What breaks the religious bondage is obedience to God. So there is power in obedience to break the religious bondage now you may say pastor i don't think you are talking about me with that statement you should be careful also i may be talking about you the bible says you should be careful lest you fall <laughs> so every one of us we can be tempted from time to time to fall into this bondage, this religious bondage, going through systems, going through actions without a relationship with God. I hope you don't fall into that trap. Always fall on the grace of God. Grace, 
grace. Grace. I bring nothing, but I rely on grace. I bring nothing to you, Lord, but I rely on grace. My righteousness are as filth rags. I rely on your grace. Grace, grace, grace. For who I am, it's because of the grace of God. I was at one time like one, a chief sinner. But because of the grace of God, I have been saved, I have been washed. I depend on the grace. Grace, 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 grace. You don't bring anything before him but grace.